So this is what I had in my heart. How many know that the anointing is not dependent necessarily on your circumstances? So uh, I used to hear um, people say, well, you know, uh, and I understand you have to be sensitive and uh, honoring to the presence of the Holy Spirit. You can dishonor him or grieve him, but at the same time, he's not some little wimpy bird, you know, that just gets spooked and flies away at the slightest little inconvenience or natural thing that doesn't go right. So having said that, um, I used to hear people say, oh, well, just the, the anointing departed when you could because of some natural thing. Well, listen, the anointing is tougher than that. And the Jesus talks about in Luke 19, this is not in my notes. In fact, I don't have any notes today, so I don't know what you're going to get. I just know it's going to probably be in Philippians chapter 3. So, but before we get there, I'm just talking out of my heart. So in Matthew, or rather Luke chapter 19, Jesus talks about the story of the talents. Remember that? And at the very end, remember the one dude, he, he buried it. And he said, you wicked, lazy servant. He said, take it from, uh, take this guy's uh, talent and give it to the one who has double. And everybody standing around said, but master, he already has double. And then Jesus said something remarkable, and I especially like it in the message translation. And I might not get it word for word, but you can look it up later. I think it's Luke 1926-ish. But it says, um, Jesus said, um, he that takes chances, advances. And he didn't say this, I'm throwing this in, but even a turtle has to stick his neck out to move forward, you know what I'm saying? And then Jesus, Jesus went on to say something like this in the message translation. He said, you can step out and take a chance and get more than you ever dreamed of, or you can play it safe and end up holding the bag. You don't want to end up holding the bag. Now, we often compare that or liken that unto natural things, resources, money. And it definitely has a huge application there for sure. But think of it this way. This is what the Holy Spirit was revealing to me this morning. What if you took that whole story and likened it or compared it to or applied it to the anointing on your life? So maybe you just got a little anointing, but don't bury it. Use what you've got. Because how many know we serve the master who is in the business of doubling what you have? Anybody take double favor on your life? How about double wisdom? How about double prosperity? Double joy, anybody? I'll take a double shot of whatever he's having. Amen. So I'm just excited. so I think we just have to sometimes press the envelope a little bit when it comes to the anointing. When it, what is the anointing? You might say it's the burden removing, yoke destroying power of God that He makes available to those who serve Him. And so we have a supernatural presence of God in our life, on our life, in our life that will reverse the works of darkness. Now, how many? Of there's a lot of darkness out there. But what did God say in the very beginning? He said, let there be. What if God would have stepped out in eternity and said, man, it sure is dark out here. We would have gotten more darkness. But instead of, he saw darkness, but he spoke into it. What he, not what he saw, but what he wanted to see or what he saw inside himself. He said, I see light. Let there be light. So you got to speak into your situation, even if it's just a big, dark void, and say, you know what? I know the will of God. How many of you do know the will of God, don't you? How many, anybody not know God's will? Okay, good. Nobody was brave enough to raise their hand. I was just going to tell you, all you got to do is pick up a copy and read it. Read the will, and you'll know God's will. So God's will for your life is, is abundant life and all the ramifications thereof so you can speak into whatever situation what God's already said and you can change your circumstance I had somebody ask me uh, not long ago um, uh, maybe a year ago but uh, this is a, a doctor PhD guy and um, somebody that I really like and respect he said but I have a question for you Pastor Cooley and that is 
uh, how do you word of faith, guys? You just, and it was very dramatic. Um, he said, how do you guys just, you just decide what you want. You just say that and expect it to happen. You know, and, you, and how, how do you justify twisting God's arm into doing what you want? I'm like, well, I don't know where you've been getting your information from, but that is not what we believe. <laughs> have you ever tried to twist God's arm? Okay. It's, I mean, have you ever tried to fast until God did what you wanted him to do? You're going to starve. It's not how it works. You don't fast to change God. You fast to change you. So here's how that works is you don't just make up what you want, decide what you want, and start saying that and, and, and you know, uh, negotiate God into doing it. Now you find out what he already said, and then you start saying that because that's what he wants to do. You just start saying, how many know that his plan and his will is a lot better than yours anyway? You ever prayed for something, and then years later you thank God he didn't answer that prayer? Remember that old country song? I thank God for unanswered prayers. It goes something like that, I don't know. but Well, sometimes in a situation I will pray, Lord, I think I want this, but Lord, you know what I want even more than I know what I want. Just give me that. So we're not just making up what we want. We're finding what he's already said he wants, and we're speaking that. And when your situation and circumstance don't line up with what God has already said, then you have every right as a blood-bought, born-again, God-fearing, people-reaching, Jesus-preaching child of God to say what he's already said, and the whole universe will go to work to make that come to pass. In the beginning, God. And then he said, light be. So if you're living in the dark today, uh, start talking. There's a light in your mouth. There's a light in your heart. Turn on your heart light. All right, turn to Philippians chapter 3. And I like not having notes because, um, well, it's just kind of fun. I hope you like me not having notes. We'll see. I've been preaching this series without any notes. Uh, and, and my goal is not to teach you everything that I know about the book of Philippians. Uh, because I'm not. I know more than I'm telling you. But what I've asked the Lord was to help me to share and minister to you what he wants you to know. Or what you need right now in this season of your life. So when we say the Word of God, the Word of God is in, on three levels. And there's the logos, that's the written word, that's a Greek word for written. And then there's the rhema, R-H-E-M-A, not rhema, rhema, and it means the spoken word. It's actually rhema, it's ah, breath involved. And then when God speaks, it's by the Spirit and there's always breath. And he, when, that's when Jesus breathed on his disciples and said, be filled with the Holy Spirit, right? And that's why there was a wind blowing in the upper room in the book of Acts. And so when the wind blows, when, as God's breathing and people get filled with the Holy Spirit, and it's a good thing. And, uh, and people look and act drunk, and, and that's where, and that's a lot of fun. So when's the last time you got drunk in the Holy Spirit? You should try it. And it's okay to get addicted because there's no hangover. It's not illegal. And you can do it every day. It's a wonderful thing. So there's the logos, the written word. And when you read the written word, how many know it's alive? The word of God is alive, quick, powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, dividing asunder between the soul and the spirit and a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. That's the word of God, Hebrews 4. So when you read God's word, it's reading you. Somebody said to me recently, they said, the Bible, it's just boring and I don't really get anything out of it. I said, they were trying to discredit the Bible. I said, you're not discrediting the Bible. You're discrediting yourself. Because if you don't understand the Bible and you don't get anything out of it, it's simply because you haven't met the God of the Bible yet. So when you read the Logos, <clears throat> then the Holy, the Holy Spirit will quicken something to you. You ever been reading the Bible and all of a sudden something just jumped out at you? 
or it hits you in the heart, or you're like, oh, whoa, that's what that means? I've, been, I've read that a thousand times, and I, have I read this before? I thought I've read, I thought I've read Philippians before, but I've never seen that before. Why, what, what's happening? That's the Holy Spirit taking the Logos, quickening it to you, and it becomes a rhema. So the Holy Spirit speaks a part of the, God's Word to you. So you have the Logos, written word, then you have the rhema, the spoken word, and then you have the incarnate, incarnation of God's word. That's the manifestation of God's word. So that's Jesus himself. He is, in the beginning, was the word. And the word was with God, and the word was God. And the word, verse 14, John 1, became flesh. That's the incarnation of the word. Did y'all know that, that we are supposed to become the incarnation of the word of God to everybody around us? So you read it, the Holy Spirit speaks it to you, and then you go and live it. So that's the word on three levels. And I'm inviting you, challenging you to start living the word of God that way. If you're not experiencing God's word on those three levels, then you're stopping short. And trust me, from a guy who's been short his whole life, you do not want to stop short. You want to press in and go all the way. <laughs> all right, let's go to uh, Philippians chapter 3, verse 1. You believe in God with me today? Finally, my brethren. Now, let me just warn you. Paul's a preacher, so when he says finally, that means he's got two chapters left. <laughs> finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. He says that a lot in this book, about 16 times. Now, remember, prison ink, he's inking this letter from prison, and he's like, hey, I'm in jail, but I'm still happy. Rejoice in the Lord for me to write the same things to you is not tedious, but it's safe. How I many know sometimes we need repeated instructions, don't we? And then he says, beware three times. Beware, beware, beware. Beware of dogs. Now, I don't know if you know it, if you've ever been in somebody's yard, and he says, beware of dog. That's where this sign, that sign came from, was from this scripture right here in the Bible from Philippians that's not true. <laughs> beware of dogs. Beware of evil workers. Beware of the mutilation. So this is all the same person or people group he's talking about here. There was a group of Judaizers, which is not just Jews. These are Jews that believed on Jesus, but they started thinking or, and preaching that you had to keep the Jewish law if you were going to be saved. Now, let me just step out and say something really bold, but it'll help you. It'll be like a, a, a bumper rail in your life. Have you ever been bowling and they put the bumper rails up? You just do better, don't you? Okay, so I'm going to help you do better. This is a bumper rail, even though you might bump up against it and go, oh, I don't know if I like that. Well, you know, uh, you might not like gravity, but it's not going to change for you. So this is a truth. I'm going to speak it in love. Anytime anybody, any group, person, religion, just fill in the blank, they add something to accepting Jesus to be saved, it is called a cult. Yeah, you got to call on the name of the Lord and be baptized in our church. Or you got to call on the name of the Lord and you've got to be circumcised. Or you got to call on the name of the Lord and anytime they add something to it, that's what the Judaizers did. Now, they said, they would come in behind Paul, and they would say, okay, yeah, Paul, what he preached, he preached Jesus, but you also have to keep the Jewish law. Now, the Jews couldn't even keep the Jewish law. How many know Jesus is enough? Jesus is just all right with me. Jesus is just all right. That's a good song. We should do that one Sunday. Where's Isaac? All right, so can you imagine the altar call today? I preach my heart out. You're convicted. You're like, oh, yes, I need God. I need Jesus. I want to accept Jesus. So just raise your hand if you want to say the prayer of salvation. People raise their hand. I lead them in the prayer of salvation. I go, now, if you'll just follow one of our elders right outside this side door, we have the circumcision booth right out there. <laughs> that would be a difficult altar call. So, man, conversions are down, Pastor. What's the problem? Well, it's a hard sale. <laughs> <laughs> so, 
So Paul said, beware, beware, beware. I don't know if he said beware three times. We should probably beware. He says, for we are the circumcision who worship God in spirit. In other words, we've been circumcised not in our flesh but in our hearts. Rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. This is, this, no wonder it's called good news, <laughs> right? I mean, nothing wrong with being circumcised. Nothing wrong with not being circumcised. And, if, and that, uh, circumcision is just a cutting away of something that does not um, lend itself into helping in reproduction. You can live without it, okay? So how many know that anything in our life that doesn't aid in reproduction in expanding the kingdom of God, we should allow the sword of the Spirit to cut that off of our life. That's living with Jesus as Lord and living by the Spirit. It's how the Holy Spirit will tell you to trim the fat in some areas. I was telling my son this morning, welcome home, by the way. This is Garrison, everybody. He's back home from Bible college. I was telling him this morning, I said, um, here's my Sunday morning ritual because you're going to be doing this one day. It'll be your ritual or something. You know, you get your own ritual, but here's what I do. I, I say, Lord, I submit every area of my life to you, every area of my life. I, I just present it to him. And there, not every Sunday, but there are some Sundays when the Lord says, um, every area? Yes, Lord, every area. Okay, well, what about that area? It's like, ooh. And, he'll, and he so delicately and kindly points something out that I need to tweak or adjust or cut off or press into. And it's not always, you know, something major, you know. Like, Kevin, you need to quit snorting cocaine. Well, okay, that's obvious, and I don't do that, by the way. <laughs> but, I mean, that would be obvious. Or, Kevin, you need to quit chasing women. You know, well, there is one woman I chase, and she lets me catch her. I like it. But I'm not talking about major things, but how many know that the Lord will, he'll, he'll speak to the little nuances of your life because he loves you and he's like, here's how I can help you get more spiritual horsepower out of your life if you'll make this tweak. Everybody uh, say this with me. Say small tweaks, giant peaks. So sometimes just a small adjustment, man, it makes all the difference. All right, so uh, he's, Paul says here, he says, We are the circumcision who worship God in spirit. Rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. For though I also might have confidence in the flesh, if anyone else thinks he may have confidence in the flesh, I more so. In other words, Paul's like, y'all, I'm the man. I was, I was the man. And he goes on to break it down and gives us specific details about his spiritual pedigree. He says, I was circumcised on the eighth day, because that's when the immune system is the highest, of the stock of Israel. Uh, he was born an Israelite of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews. Concerning the law, I was a Pharisee. I had reached the top pinnacle. Concerning zeal, persecuting the church. Concerning the righteousness which is by the law, blameless. But... What things were gained to me, these I have counted loss for Christ. Everybody say Christ. Now, Christ is not Jesus' last name. Jesus Christ. That's not, it's not, no, Christ is more his title than his name. Christ means the, like the Messiah. It means the anointed one, Christ. He's been christened. Christ, the anointed one, and his anointing. So, the, meaning the actual oil itself that has those five ingredients we talked about a couple of weeks ago. So, Jesus, the anointed one, is what you could read it that way. So, he says, I counted all things lost for the anointing. For having, you know, we don't have to go into the temple anymore. We have become the temple. So we don't have to go inside of a temple made with hands to find or seek God. But now God doesn't dwell in temples made with hands. He dwells inside of men. I've heard about the temple of old, how the king filled it with gold. But now you dwell in men like the prophets foretold. And that was the prophecy. He's like, I'm going to dwell not just with you, but in you, inside of you. 
So he, Paul says, all that law keeping, all these trophies, everything I achieved. But be, I mean, I reached the top pinnacle in my industry. I was a Pharisee of the Pharisees. I was, I was trained in the Harvard School of Pharisaical Training. And I count all those trof- trophies. I count them, he says. And then, Now, that word count, I count it all as law. Well. That's an accounting term. So if we have any bookkeepers in the house, it, it's a literal. He says, so this is what Paul, think about it. Here's Paul. He's in a Roman jail. He has some time on his hands. He's got nothing else to do, you know? He's sitting there, and he's, he's, he's making an account, giving an account for his life. So I don't know if he has a piece of paper, because we, we know he's a writer, so he ha- might have some parchment and different things. And he's sitting there, and he's like, here's everything that I've accomplished. You know, I was a Pharisee, all these things. Now, here's everything since I've been born again I've accomplished for the kingdom of God. I've gone, I've preached clear around the Mediterranean Sea and all the major cities. I've planted churches. I've worked signs, wonders, and miracles. I've raised the dead. I've written two-thirds of what's going to be the New Testament. How many of Paul had done some stuff? And so he was sitting there, and he, maybe he got to, he, he's in, he can't do anything. He's just, he's giving an account. He's, he's, he's going through, tabulating, and he is, what's the word they use when they, he's auditing his life. And he might think, you know what? I've done more for God than anybody I know. Nobody's probably going to catch me. I think I'll just chill. Maybe get a prison tattoo. (laughs) You know, I've done a lot. But Paul, notice what he says. He said, this is so powerful. He says, but what things were gained to me, these things I have counted as loss for Christ. Verse 8, look at verse 8. Yet indeed I also count all things loss for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count, there's that accounting word again, count them as rubbish. One translation says as dog poo, that I may gain Christ, not Jesus, but the anointing that Jesus operated in. He said, I want to operate in that same anointing. And that is available today. Now, I'm going to drop a truth bomb on you. So here's another bumper rail for you. Paul said, I've I've done a lot for God. But I'm not going to sit back on my accomplishments. No. I've taken an audit of my life, and I realize I've done a lot for God. But here's the thing that I want you to do today. I want you to also think about the things that you've not done yet that you're supposed to. Paul said, I've accomplished a lot for God. But there are things that God gave me on my job description, on my God-given goal list that have not yet come to pass. So now I'm going to push aside all my past accomplishments and I'm going to hone in on spending the rest of my life to fulfill those things that God has called me to do. Now, someone would say, well, Paul, how are you going to do that? You're in jail awaiting trial. You might get the death penalty. Paul said, yeah, I was trying to decide whether or not I was going to live or die. You know, dying would just be awesome because I'd get to go be with Jesus. The only way I can get closer to him is like to die and be with him. He goes, that would be awesome. He goes, but it would be better for you guys if I kept living. So I've decided I'm going to keep living. Well, you don't know if you're going to keep living, Paul. You never know when your time is going to come. Yeah, uh, you do know because um, I've just decided I'm not going to die yet. So how many know whether you live or die is a lot up to you? Not some cosmic calendar in the universe somewhere that has a date on it, and that's your death day. No. Whoever taught you that did not get that out of the Bible. It's just religion. Now, that's another sermon for another Sunday. I'll revisit that again in my upcoming series called Cow Tipping. (laughs) We'll tip over some sacred cows. And that's one of them. But Paul said... I've done a lot for God, but I'm not just going to walk around bragging about all that I've done for God and for Jesus. I'm not going to say, hey, everybody, it's good to be here at Harvest Church today. I'm the Apostle Paul. I want to tell you about all the churches I've planted. Isn't that great? He's like, no, no, no. I don't have time to tell people what I've done because I still have so much left to do. Wow, what a perspective. Now, I love all y'all, 
That's what we say down here in the South. I love all y'all. And I appreciate everything you've done in the past for God and for this church and for getting the gospel out in India and Mobile. And all. But we have a lot left to do. So let's take Paul's advice here. And he says, let's count it all as loss that I might be found in Christ. Let's keep reading. We're going to be, start reading verse 9. That I may be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith. Here we go. That I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his passions being conformed to his death, if by any means I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. One translation says that I may attain to the resurrection of the dead even while still in the body. Well, how does that happen? You don't die. You, you get caught up to meet him in the air. Or, and or, you live or how to walk in and operate in resurrection power now even while you're still living in this life. And that is what is available to us, and that's where I want us to press the envelope a little bit and start plumbing the depths of all that Jesus made available to us instead of just skimming the surface. What do you mean skimming the surface, Pastor? Oh, yeah, Jesus is my Lord. I go to church, I give him the offering, and I'm going to heaven. Okay, that's great, but that's just this much of what's available to you. Don't you want more? I mean, some people don't. They're like, no, I'm good. And I think those people are going to live under a bridge in heaven. Because <laughs> you, you're saved by grace, but you're rewarded by works. So let's be good stewards of the talents he's given us, the abundant life, the eternal life he's given us. And let's not just get enough of it to get saved and go to heaven. That's great. But why just... Get saved and go to heaven when you can walk in resurrection power and you can lay hands on the sick and they'll recover and you can pray in a heavenly language that the devil doesn't know what you're saying, but you're praying out the perfect will of God, mysteries revealed, when you can, in fact, be shown things to come by the Holy Spirit and you can prepare, and, and whether it's in the economy, whether it's in your business, whether it's in your family, whether it's just don't go home that way, go this way. Well, wow, there was a big accident. How did you know to avoid that? Well, I didn't, but the Holy Spirit said go home this way. And so, or... Have you ever followed one of those little still small voices and, and, and you, the still small voice and you got home and you're like, well, nothing happened. Huh? Well, that was the point. God was trying to make sure nothing happened because you don't know what would have happened had you gone the other way. So just listen to that. Don't get paranoid, you know, and go, oh, God, what color socks should I wear today? No, I mean, just, just you're walking in peace. You're walking. You're led by the, those that are led by the spirit of God. They are the sons of God. They are the daughters of God. Come on, everybody say, I'm God's kid. So you know him. You, Jesus said, you, the Holy, you know him. The world doesn't know him, but you know him, don't you? You know the Holy Spirit, don't you? Because he lives in you. And so let's live that spirit-filled, spirit-led, abundant life. Not just, you know, yep, I go to church and I... I'm, how many of the devil goes to church? Not this one, but he goes to church. I don't let him in. So, um, and you can't, so there you go. But anyway, he, he said that I might know him and the power of his resurrection. So why? I'm gonna re I'm, here's the big reveal. I'm going to give you the big secret today. How could Paul, he's been beat up, shipwrecked, he's, 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 he's starved before, he's had abundance, he, he's, he's been persecuted, he's been stoned and left for dead, all these things. And how can, now he's in jail. He's sitting there waiting to be, go on trial and possibly receive the death penalty. And how can he 16 times say, rejoice again? I say, rejoice. I'm just, I'm just so full of joy. I'm just so excited to get back to work for God. How could he go through all that and still have that? Man, people betrayed him. People rejected him. People followed him from city to city to persecute him. People that he loved and discipled turned their back on. How could he go through all that and still be Paul walking in joy? The joy of the Lord is my strength. How could he do that? This verse tells us that I might know him. It's your relationship with God that sustains you and that activates all of the fruit of the Spirit in your life. Amen. They are presence activated. In his presence is what? Fullness of joy. So if you see a sad Christian, you know they hadn't been in God's presence lately. It's a tell. 
And if we don't judge people for that or criticize them for that, but we could exhort them and we grieve with those who grieve, we rejoice with those who rejoice, but as we're grieving with those who grieve, we put our arm around them and we escort them into the presence of God. Let's go to God in prayer about this. Because why? When you get in his presence, that's when the joy starts flowing. And the joy of the Lord is your what? Strength. So if you lose your joy, you lose your strength. If you need to get your strength back, get your joy back. How do you get your joy back? Get in God's presence. It's that simple. Knowing him. Knowing him. My wife and I, we try to have coffee together together, together every morning. And uh, we don't do it every morning, but we get pretty close. And we just sit there and drink coffee and we talk. And, and there's no agenda. We just talk. And it could be about any number of things. But we connect. And so that's that connection. And then what was it? It was something this weekend. We had an aha moment about something in our life. Oh, so I have a tendency to get overwhelmed when, like when, like if a room is a mess or the kitchen's, I'm like, oh my God, where do I start, you know? But once you get me started, I'm going to work and I got a plan and it's going to get done. Now, she has a tendency. She comes in and goes, oh, hey, honey, it's no big deal. Here, you get, you get started on this, blah, 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 and she organizes it, and I get started. And then about halfway through, she's like, oh, my God, I'm overwhelmed. We're never going to get this done. I'm like, come on, we can do this. So we're a great team. <laughs> we really are. And so we had that aha moment about ourselves this weekend. I'm like, no wonder the Lord put us together. We needed each other. You know, without you, I'd never get started. And without me, you'd never finish. <laughs> so we're a great team. But knowing each other brings, there's a, there's a joy, there's an intimacy. Now, when you connect with the Lord, when you have coffee time with Jesus and you connect with him, you're just going to have that kind of uh, impact on you where you're going to, well, you, you can't leave his presence sad. You can't leave his presence discouraged. I guess you could choose to, but if you listen to what he's saying and get in his presence, it's going to affect you. It's, I used to say it like this. Um, when I was um, younger, I'm still young. When I was younger, uh, you know, uh, the last time I had a blue jean jacket, I was like, you know, in high school. And uh, so there was this place you'd go to, and uh, it was really a terrible idea. Uh, and it was a alcohol-free bar for teenagers. And when I look back, I'm like, they were just discipling us to go to the bar when we got old enough. It was stupid. So anyway, there was everything that would happen at a bar happened there except for, well, including the alcohol. They just, you know, didn't know it. But, uh, but there was, you know, there was smoking and there was fighting in the parking lot and there was girls and there was dancing. And, and so, yep, I was there. And, um, and, and I was, so because I was an athlete, I, I never smoked because I didn't want it to, you know, hurt my lungs, my car. So, but when I would come home, Nana, she'd be like, have you been smoking? No, ma'am. And she'd pop me with her, that little left hand to her. She goes, don't you lie to me. I'm like, mom, I'm not smoking. I was just like, why do you smell like cigarettes? I'm like, because I was in a room filled with people smoking. I was in that atmosphere. How I many if you get in the wrong atmosphere, the atmosphere will get in you. The same thing is true in this atmosphere. In his presence is fullness of joy. You get in here, you start breathing in joy and singing joy and laughing in joy and laughing out joy. And, and so you get in an atmosphere like this, then chains start falling off, chains start breaking and breakthroughs start happening. And, and you start realizing my situation ain't no big deal because greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. Well, you get in that right atmosphere, that atmosphere gets in you and you get in heaven and heaven gets in you. And when you go and walking around, heaven's walking around in you and around you. And, and that's what Paul said. He's, I think it's the, the Amplified. It goes, I've come to realize the supreme advantage of knowing Christ. I got an advantage over everybody else because I know Jesus. And when you know him, I mean, it's, 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 it's who you know, <laughs> right? It's who you know. And Paul realized it's all about who you know. This is so good. Let me keep reading. Verse 11. Uh, let's go to verse 12. He said, not that I have already attained. Don't misunderstand. I haven't, I haven't finished everything. I haven't been perfected. But I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus also laid hold of me. Did you know he laid hold of you for a reason? And don't quit pressing until you accomplish that for which he laid hold of you. 
Um, no, notice Paul, he says, I, if you think that Christianity is passive, then you've never read this verse because he says, I press. One translation says, he goes, I strain, every, like a runner, run, I strain every nerve reaching for that finish line, for that prize. I think Paul must have been an athlete. Because he always likened everything to boxing, to racing, you know, to wrestling. You know, we wrestle not against flesh, but he, he always had all these athletic, you know, uh, illustrations. And so, uh, and, and you know, the, the games were a, a big deal at, at this time in, in history. So everybody they could relate to relate to farming and athletics and soldiering. So that's what Paul likened a lot of things to. And he, so he said, "I press on. I press." Brethren, let's go to verse 13. I do not count myself to have apprehended. That word apprehended is, is a really interesting word in, in the Greek that I don't have time to tell you about. But, um, but one thing I do. Everybody say one thing. one thing. Forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead. Now, again, what's he forgetting here? Well, he's forgetting his past sinful life when he persecuted the church. No, no, no. He's already dealt with that. He's not talking about that. He's like, I'm forgetting my accomplishments that I've done for God in Christ Jesus because I still got things left to do. You know what keeps us from our greatest successes? It's our past successes. We enjoy them so much that we forget to keep running. He said, I keep pressing. So let's go to verse 14. I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. I press toward the goal. Everybody say it with me. I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Say, I press toward the goal. So do you just achieve the goal haphazardly, lackadaisically? Can you just chill and get the goal? No, you have to do what? Press, strain every nerve like a runner. He's throwing off everything he can. He's stripping down to just the, the, his skivvies. Why? So he's not carrying any extra weight so he can grow as fast as he can go. And he's, 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 he wants to cross that finish line. Okay? So that's how we're supposed to live. This is so good. Therefore, verse 15. Let us, as many as are mature, everybody say, that's me. that's me, have this mind. What mind? The mind of pressing. Now, again, I'm going to back up to verse 13. But one thing I do, what's the one thing? Forgetting your past achievements and pressing towards the next thing God's called you to do. So your past achievements, achievements were for yesterday. Your accomplishments were for yesterday. Your vision is for today. Your future accomplishments are for today. We remember what God has done and done through us to encourage us because he's to encourage us in his faithfulness because we still got something left to do. So if you're still sucking air down here on the planet, there's something for you to do. And it's not just to sit there or sit there. You got something to do of eternal value. Now, I could just, you want to hear my opinion about something, and I offer it reluctantly because, you know, what opinions are like. Armpits. Everybody has a couple, and they don't smell that great. So you want to hear an opinion about something? So Jesus said in Matthew 25, this generation will not pass away until it sees the fulfillment of all these things. That was the tribulation, the catching away of the church, everything. Well, if, if Israel is the timepiece, the fig tree, the fig tree... Became, can a nation be born in a day? Well, yeah, in 1948, Israel was born in a day. If a generation is 80 years, then 80 years from, from 1948 is when? Any mathematicians in here? 2028. So that means the, the greatest outpouring of God's spirit the world's ever seen, the greatest influx of souls into the kingdom of God that the history has ever seen. Billions of people are going to come to the saving knowledge of Jesus. And the church is going to be caught up to meet him in the air. And the tribulation is going to start and be finished before that generation passes away. So who cares who our next president is? We ain't going to be here for the whole four years anyhow. That's my opinion. My opinion. Some are like, whoa. So having said all that, what are you going to do? It's the last days. What are you going to do with the time you got left? 
So oh, it's not, I've been hearing it's the last days for 50 years. Well, let me put it to you this way. It's your last days. You only go around once. What are you going to do? What, what, would you, what would you do differently? I'm not saying that you listen to me with balance here. What would you do if you knew that in the church age we had about 12 to 18 months left? Would it change your behavior in any way? Would it change your value system in any way? Would it change how you give? Would it change how you live? Would it change how you treat your neighbors? Would it change how you interact with those kids at school? What would it change? Some people are like, I would go charge up all my credit cards. No, that's stupid. That's foolish. I'm not saying be foolish. What would you do of eternal value if you knew? Okay, I better, I'm sorry. I just dropped a bomb on y'all, and y'all are looking at me funny, but... Verse 15, therefore let us as many as are mature have this mind. And if anyone of you think otherwise, God will reveal even this to you. I love Paul. He's like, I'm right. And if you think otherwise, God will show you that I'm right. What a guy. (laughs) Verse 16, nevertheless, to the degree that we have already attained or to the degree that we've already arrived, let us walk by the same rule Let us be of the same mind. Brethren, join in following my example and note those who so walk as you you have us for a pattern. So he's like, follow me as I follow Christ, basically. Isn't that right? So he's like, if you don't know what to do, just watch me. Wow. You know what my prayer is? Is that I could say that of myself to you. Now, I'm not saying that I've attained to that. But that's my goal. Now, you know what else I'm praying? That you would be able to say that too. Hey, y'all not sure what to do? Just watch me. Just watch me. All right. You got your Bibles there? You reading with me? All right. Let's go to the next verse. Verse 18. For many walk of whom I have told you often and now tell you even weeping that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is in their shame. Why? Why why are they living that way? Because it it tells you, who set their mind on earthly things. So when you set, did you know that whether you are making an eternal impact in the kingdom of God or you're just a flesh pot, it all goes back to where you set your mind. What do you think? You got to think about what you think about. Because your flesh... You can train it to serve God, but it's like training a wild animal, okay? Even once it's trained, don't trust it. It'll turn on you in a second. Paul said, make no provision for the flesh. Now, your spirit, you know, that spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Your spirit wants to serve God. Now, so there's a swing vote in the middle. You got your flesh, you got your spirit. The swing vote is between your ears. Now, wherever you set your mind, that's the direction your life's going to go. If you set your mind on things above, like Colossians tells us to do, and like uh, 1 Corinthians 10.4 tells us to do, then you're going to serve God with your spirit. You're going to tell your your flesh, your body is going to become your slave that serves the purposes of God. Now, but if you set your mind on fleshly things, on earthly things, then your spirit, you're going to become a slave to your flesh instead of your flesh becoming your slave. Anybody listening to me this morning telling y'all how to win, 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 win? Okay? This is the secret sauce. This is the stuff. Okay? He said, now, there are some folks. He goes, I tell you this weeping. They've become enemies of the cross of Jesus Christ. Why? Because they have their minds set on the wrong stuff. Hmm. All right. Verse 20, he says, For our citizenship is in heaven, from which also we eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. How many know he's coming? He said, when's he coming, Pastor? Soon. How soon? I don't know, but I think, you know, the Bible says he's coming. He'll be riding a white horse. I think he's saddling his horse. I do. I really do. I don't know what his horse's name is, Uh, Maybe it's a horse with no name. I don't know. There's a song in there somewhere, but 
But I think he's saddling his horse. Saddle up your horses. We got a trail to blaze. Remember that song from the 90s? Through the wild blue yonder of God's amazing grace. You don't remember that song? Was that my, what was that guy's name? Uh, Stephen Curtis Chapman. Yeah. He was the dude, man, in the 90s. All right. Riding through the desert on a horse, no name. For our citizenship is in heaven. Everybody say, I'm from heaven. Turn to your neighbor and say, I'm heavenly. <laughs> I guess you are. Our citizenship is in heaven. So guess what? How important, it is important, but how important is it for a citizen of heaven who the president of America is? I mean, we should vote our conscience and vote our biblical value, all that, yeah, 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 yeah. But ultimately, we're not from here. Well, what if the wrong person gets in office? They will. They will. Pastor, are you prophesying? No. Nope. Just telling you. Just telling you. So whoever gets an office, how much is it going to impact us as citizens of heaven? Well, what if the economy goes to pot? We're, we don't, this is not, we're in a different, we're in a kingdom economy. Okay, I'm, I'm, I've done gone to meddling now. Let me get back to the word. All right, verse 21. We're waiting for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly bodies. Woo, man. That it may be conformed to his glorious body. Man, I'm going to be a stud in eternity. According to the working by which he is able even to subdue all things to himself. It don't matter who the president is. When he comes back, he's subduing everybody. He's taking over. He didn't come to take part. He's coming to take over. So, yeah, we should pray for those in authority that we may live a quiet and peaceful life and all that. But we're going to prosper no matter what. If Isaac can prosper in a famine, we can prosper with a Democrat president, a Republican president, an independent president, no president. We are not of this world. I was in this years ago. I was in the mall. And uh, this guy had one of those alien T-shirts on, you know, like the oval head, you know, silhouette of an alien. And, uh, and I went up to him. I said, hey, I like your shirt. He's like, here I go. I'm like, I am one. He's like, you, you am what? An alien. He's like, <laughs> I said, no, I really am. He's like, what do you mean? I'm like, I'm not from this world, man. And he was like, Okay. He just backed away slowly. <laughs> I was a youth pastor then, so I was honorary. I liked messing with people. But, you know, we're not. We're, the Bible says that we're aliens. We're just passing through. It's pretty cool, isn't it? We're born again. Jesus is the new Adam, the second Adam, the head of a new race. Old things are passed away. All things are become brand new. And all these new things, it goes on to say, are from God. You're amazing in Christ Jesus. That's a key part of the phrase, by the way. Because without Christ Jesus, not so much. How do I know? Because <laughs> we're all in that same boat, right? We're in this love together. We're in Christ Jesus. All things are made new. That's what connects us. That's what, that's what makes us equals is because Jesus made us equals with himself. Now, not his deity, he laid all that aside, but he came and lived as a man anointed by God. And so he, he, in other words, he's an example of what Adam was supposed to be. And now we can be all that Jesus was and is. As he is, so are we also in this world. I'm telling you, the depths of this thing are unfathomable. The, the, your potential, all that's in you, 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 that's why we have to renew our mind to it. That's why it's called the almost too good to be true news because you start, you think, that can't be true. But it is. It's the gospel is good news. Mm. If I could just get you to believe it a little bit more today, I've, I've done my job. So our big takeaway today is all about knowing him. It all connects to your relationship with him. Do you know him? Do you know him? All right, let me pray for you. Lord, thank you for this amazing church. I call them blessed today. And I just ask right now that you would... Uh
convict each and every one of us of the part of the scripture that you want to massage into our spirits and into our minds today, that our minds might be renewed and that we might walk more like Christ walks, live like he lives in the anointing that reverses darkness everywhere we go. If you're watching us today or you're in the room today and you've never made Jesus the Lord of your life, I'm gonna lead you in the prayer of salvation. Would you just invite God into your life? He'll change everything. He makes all things new. Would you pray this with me right now? Say, dear Heavenly Father, I repent of my sins and I ask, Jesus, save me. I call on your name. Thank you for dying in my place for my sins. They buried you, but on the third day, God raised you from the dead. And I say, Jesus, you're my Lord. I am yours and you are mine. Fill me with your spirit. Give me power to live this new life. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, amen. If you prayed that prayer, you just got ushered into the kingdom of God. Amen. Amen.